Purgatory, Chapter 13, Pains of Purgatory To the two preceding facts we shall add a third, taken from the annals of the company of Jesus. We speak of a prodigy which was wrought in the person of Anthony Pereira, brother conjurer of that company, who died in the odor of sanctity at the College of Evora in Portugal. August 1st, 1645. Forty-six years previous, in 1599, five years after his entrance into the novitiate, this brother was attacked by a mortal malady on the island of St. Michael, one of the Azeros. A few moments after he had received the last sacraments in presence of his whole community, who assisted him in his agony, he appeared to breathe forth his soul, and soon became cold as a corpse. The appearance, though almost imperceptible, of a slight beating of the heart, alone prevented them of interring him immediately. He was therefore left for three entire days upon his bed, and his body already gave evident signs of decomposition, when suddenly on the fourth day he opened his eyes, breathed, and spoke. He was then obliged by obedience to relate to his superior, Father Louis Pereiro, all that he had passed within him since the last terrible moments of his agony. We here give an abridged account of it, as written by his own hand. I saw first, he says, from my deathbed, my father, St. Ignatius, accompanied by several fathers from heaven, who came to visit his sick children. Seeking those whom he thought worthy to be offered by him and his companions to the Lord. When he drew near to me, I believed for a moment that he would take me, and my heart thrilled with joy, but soon he pointed out to me that of which I must correct myself before obtaining so great a happiness. Then, nevertheless, by a mysterious disposition of divine providence, the soul of Brother Pierre separated itself momentarily from his body, and immediately a hideous troop of demons rushed towards him and filled him with horror. At the same moment his guardian angel and St. Anthony of Padua, his countryman and patron, descended from heaven, put to flight his enemies, and invited him to accompany him to take a glimpse of and taste for a moment the joys and sufferings of eternity. They led me then by turns, he adds, towards a place of delights, where they showed me a crown of incomparable glory, but which I had not yet as merited. Then to brink of an abyss, where I saw the reprobate souls fall into eternal fire, crushed like the grains of wheat, cast upon a millstone that turns without intermission. The infernal gulf was like one of those wine kilns where at times, the flames are, as it were, stifled by the mass of materials thrown into them, but which feeds the fire that it may burst forth with more terrible violence. Led from thence to the tribunal of the sovereign judge, Anthony Pereira heard himself condemned to the fire of purgatory, and nothing, he assures us, can give any idea of what is suffered there, nor for the state of agony to which the souls are reduced by the desire and the delay of their enjoyment of God and of his sacred presence. When by the command of God his soul had been reunited with his body, the renewed tortures of his malady for six entire months, where the additional tortures of fire and iron caused the flesh already incurably tainted with the corruption of his first death, to fall in pieces, Yet not this, nor the frightful penances to which he unceasingly delivered himself, so far as obedience permitted, during the forty-six years of his new life, could appease his thirst for sufferings and expiation. All this, he said, is nothing in comparison with what the justice and infinite mercy of God has caused me, not only to witness, but also to endure. In fine, as an authentic seal upon so many marvels, Brother Pierre discovered to his superior 
in detail the secret design of providence regarding the future restoration of the kingdom of portugal more than half a century before it happened but we may add without fear that the highest guarantee of all these prodigies was the astonishing degree of sanctity to which brother pierre ceased not to elevate himself from day to day let us relate a similar instance which confirms in every point that which we have just read. We find it in the life of the venerable servant of God, Angelina Ptolemy, a Dominican nun. She was raised from the dead by her own brother and gave a testimony of the rigor of God's judgment exactly conformable to the president. Blessed John Baptist Ptolemy, whose rare virtues and the gifts of miracles have placed on our altars, had a sister, Angelina Ptolemy, the heroism of which virtue had also been recognized by the church. She fell dangerously sick, and her holy brother, by earnest prayer, besought her cure. Our Lord replied, as he did formerly to the sister of Lazarus, that he would not cure Angelina, but he would do more. He would raise her from the dead, for the glory of God and the good of souls. She died recommending herself to the prayers of her holy brother. While she was being carried to the tomb, blessed John Baptist, in obedience, no doubt in inspiration of the Holy Spirit, approached the coffin and, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, commanded his sister to come forth. Immediately she woke from the, her profound slumber and returned to life. That holy soul seemed struck with terror, and related such things concerning the severity of God's judgment as make us shudder. She commenced at the same time to lead a life which proved the truth of her words. Her penance was frightful, not content with ordinary practices of the saints, such as fasting, watching, hair shirts, and bloody disciplines. She went as far as to cast herself into flames, and to roll herself therein until her flesh was entirely burnt. Her masqueraded body became an object of pity and horror. She was censured and accused of destroying, by her excess, the idea of true Christian penance. She continued, nevertheless, and contented herself with replying, If you knew the rigors of the judgments of God, you would not speak thus. What are my trifling penances compared with the torments reserved in the other life for those infidelities which we so easily permit ourselves in this world? What are they? What are they? Would that I could do a hundred times more. There is no question here, as we see, of the tortures to which great sinners converted before death are subjected but of the chastisements which God inflicts upon a fervent religious for the slightest faults. Purgatory, Chapter 14 The Pains of Purgatory Apparition of Foligino The Dominican Religious of Zambara The same rigor reveals itself in a more recent apparition, where a religious who died after an exemplary life makes known her sufferings in a manner calculated to inspire a soul with terror. The event took place on November 16, 1859, at Foligino, near Assisi in Italy. It made a great noise in the country, and besides the visible mark which was seen, an inquiry made in due form by competent authority establishes it as an incontestable fact. There was at the convent of Franciscan territories in Foligino a sister named Teresa Gesta, who had been for many years mistress of novices, and who at the same time had charge of the sacristy in the community. She was born at Bastia in Coricia in 1797, and entered the monastery in the year 1826. Sister Teresa was a model of fervor and charity. We need not be astonished, said her director, if God glorifies her by some prodigy after her death. 
She died suddenly, November 4, 1859, of a stroke of apoplexy. Twelve days later, on November 16th, a sister named Anna Felicia, who succeeded her in office, went to the sacristy and was about to enter, when she heard moans which appeared to come from the interior of the room. Somewhat afraid, she hastened to open the door. There was no one. Again she hears moans, and distinctly that notwithstanding her ordinary coverage, she felt herself overpowered by fear. Jesus, Mary, she cried. What can that be? She had not finished speaking when she heard a plaintive voice, accompanied with a painful sigh. Oh, my God, how I suffer. Oh, Dio, che pino tanto. The sister, stupefied, immediately recognized the voice of poor Sister Teresa. Then the room was filled with a thick smoke, and the spirit of Sister Teresa appeared, moving towards the door and gliding along by the wall. Having reached the door, she cried aloud, Behold a proof of the mercy of God. Saying these words, she struck the upper panel of the door and left the print of her right hand, burnt in the wood as with a red-hot iron. She then disappeared. Sister Anna Felicia was left half dead with fright. She burst forth into loud cries for help. One of her companions ran, then a second, and finally the whole community. They pressed round her, astonished to find a strong odor of burnt wood. Sister Anna Felicia told what had occurred, and showed them the terrible impression on the door. They instantly recognized the hand of Sister Teresa, which had been remarkably small. Terrified, they took to flight and ran to the choir, where they passed the night in prayer and penance for the departed, and the following morning all received Holy Communion for the repose of her soul. The news spread outside the convent walls, and many communities in the city united their prayers with those of the Franciscans. On the third day, November 18th, Sister Anna Felicia, on going in the evening to her cell, heard herself called by her name and recognized perfectly the voice of Sister Teresa. At the same instant, a globe of brilliant light appeared before her, illuminating her cell with the brightness of daylight. She then heard Sister Teresa pronounce these words in a joyful and triumphant voice. I died on a Friday, the day of the Passion, and behold on a Friday I enter in eternal glory. Be strong to bear the cross. Be courageous to suffer. Love poverty. Then adding affectionately, Adieu, adieu, adieu. She became transfigured, and a light, white, and dazzling cloud rose towards heaven and disappeared. During the investigation, which was held immediately, November 23rd, in the presence of a large number of witnesses, the tomb of Sister Teresa was opened and the impression upon the door was found to correspond exactly with the hand of the deceased. The door with the bird print of the hand, adds Monsignor Cigar, is preserved with great veneration in the convent. The mother abbess, witness of the fact, was pleased to show it to me herself. Wishing to assure myself of the perfect exactitude of these details related by Monsignor Cigar, I wrote to the Bishop of Foligno. He replied by giving me a circumstantial account, perfectly according with the above, and accompanied by a facsimile of the miraculous mark. This narrative explains the cause of the terrible expiation to which Sister Teresa was subjected. After saying, Ah, how much I suffer, O oh, Dio che pino tanto, she added that it was for having, in the exercise of her office of sacristan, transgressed some points the strict poverty prescribed by the rule. Thus we see divine justice punishes most severely the slightest faults. It may be here asked why the apparition, when making the mysterious mark in the door, 
called it a proof of the mercy of God. It is because in giving us a warning of this kind, God shows us a great mercy. He urges us in the most efficacious manner to assist the poor suffering souls and to be vigilant in our own regard. While speaking of this subject, we may relate a similar instance which happened in Spain and which caused great rumors in the country. Ferdinand of Castile thus relates in his History of St. Dominic, a Dominican religious led a holy life in his convent at Zamora, a city of the kingdom of Leon. He was united in the bonds of a pious friendship with a Franciscan brother like himself, a man of great virtue. One day, when conversing together on the subject of eternity, they mutually promised that, if it pleased God, the first who died should appear to the other to give him some solitary advice. The friar minor died first, and one day, whilst his friend, the son of St. Dominic, was preparing the refractory, he appeared to him. After saluting him with respect and affection, he told him that he was among the elect, but before that he could be admitted into the enjoyment of eternal happiness, there remained much to be suffered for an infinity of small faults, of which he had not sufficiently repented during this life. Nothing on earth, he added, can give an idea of the torments which I endure, and of which God permits me to give you a visible proof. Saying these words, he placed his right hand upon the table of the refractory, and the mark remained impressed upon the charred wood, as though it had been applied with a red-hot iron. Such was the lesson which the fervent deceased Franciscan gave his loving friend. It was of profit not only to him, but all those who came to see the burnt mark, so profoundly significant. For this table became an object of piety, which people came from all parts to look upon. It is still to be seen at Zamora, says Father Rosangali, at the time at which I write, towards the middle of the last century, to protect it, the spot had been covered with a sheet of copper. It was preserved until the end of the last century. Since then it has been destroyed during the revolutions, like so many other religious memorials. 